everybody. I think people are still getting comfortable and joining, so welcome in whenever you're ready. Um, just a reminder that these are all recorded, so if you're joining now, that's great, but if you're watching this recorded, thanks for watching. Today, you should have the Grenache from Vintage Press, um, and this is the 2020 Vintage, so the vineyard um, where these grapes came from is called Vintage Press Vineyards. We talked about this a couple weeks ago when we drank the Artist Blend. Um, I know I recommended uh, that if you have the Grenache, um, this Grenache Rosé tonight, that you could also come in with the Artist Blend and drink those side by side because these Grenache grapes from Vintage Press Vineyards went into the Artist Blend as well and contribute to that. So if you wanna do a side by side comparison, by all means do it. If you don't have this wine, you can still go to our website and purchase the Summer Sip and Pack. There is no picture for it. And if there is no picture on what you click on on the shop page, it means you have the right pack. This is for series nine through 12. Um, and these will be the last three wines for the Summer Sip and Series. So make sure you go online and get those wines. They are also at a discounted price. So anytime you can take advantage of these mixed packs that we post online, whether you're watching the virtual sessions or not, do it um, because that discount is a, is a big deal. Um, I know some of y'all are joining now, so please tell me where you're calling from. Say hi uh, if you've spent the last couple of months doing Summer Sipping with me. Next week, we will be tasting the It's Not High Estate. This is the 2017 vintage. If you are a member with us, that's awesome. Come to the September release party and we will be pouring the 2018 High Estate to Not. So you can actually do a nice comparison of those. So make sure you drink this one next week, but also pick up some extra ones so that you can do a really cool side-by-side -side comparison because a big thing in Texas is uh, vintage variation and you really, really will see a big shift from year to year. And then the last wine we'll be drinking for summer sipping is the Marsan and uh, this is the white wine. Um, I recommended a little while ago that if you're gonna drink that Marsan in the last week, you should also pick up a Roussan. Um, so this is something that we have on our website right now. Um, pick one up. We have a couple of other really cool wines on our website that I just wanted to mention are there um, because we've talked a bit about them. We have Tanat from Timmins Estate. This is up in the Texas High Plains. So next week, if you'd like to come in with a Tanat High Estate and a Tanat from Timmins Vineyard, um, that would be a really cool comparison. Um, the Timmins Tanat is a little bit more delicate and floral, and I find Tanat High Estate to be robust, full-bodied, really, really game-changing. Um, we also have Tariga Nacional on the website, and that's from Phillips Vineyard. We talked about this a couple weeks ago, and I encourage that everyone go try Tariga Nacional, which is originally a Portuguese grape, but it's growing fantastically in Texas, along with a bunch of other Portuguese and Spanish grape varieties. We also have Black Shop 2 on the website, and this is that matterized wine uh, made from white wine grapes, um, no, I'm sorry. I get those confused. The Black Jacques too is uh, made from uh, Black Spanish. So that is a port style wine. It's uh, something that we talked about a couple weeks ago. It is on the website right now and we're running low on it. So make sure you pick a bottle of that up. It is a fortified dessert wine. So expect it to be sweet. Get some dark chocolate, get a uh, flourless dark chocolate cake, get some ice cream, whatever you want. Um, with something sweet to taste alongside it, the wine will actually taste drier, and that is the magic of food and wine pairing. And uh, finally, we have Merved from Annie's Block, which is something that um, I thought we were out of. It's the 2018 vintage. I mean, if you're not familiar with that, uh, Annie's Block is a block on our own estate named after Bill Blackman's uh, daughter. So go pick all of those up, um, pick up another summer sip and pack, and we'll drink all of those in the next couple of weeks. I'm going to see who all's joining. Hi, Christopher. Hi, Sherry. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Laura and Kelly. Oh, yeah. So last week I was in um, California in Russian River Valley. Um, if I look tired today, it is because that trip just completely flattened me out. Um, flights were really interesting. Um, it's uh, We had several canceled flights. So I ended up staying an extra day in California and uh, ended up going over to San Francisco. So that was was kind of cool, um, but I'm still very tired and recovering from it. Um, this is the first wine that I'm going to have 
since my trip. Um, I just took a, a couple days to step away from wine because I find that you taste a lot of wine together. Um, you can sometimes lose the delicacy from wine to wine. And I, I expect this to be a really explosive wine to me, even though it's a very light colored rosé because I just haven't had not drink wine in a couple days. Hi, Dottie. Oh yeah, Kelly, great question. And I will address that. Um, I hope you'll notice I, my book is representing everywhere I go. I wish I could do this show on the road. How cool would that be if I traveled to a different wine region every single week and uh, just did a, a class from that wine region? You could do some cool Texas versus the world comparisons that way. Uh, yes, please open your wines, guys. Um, hi, Brian and Vonda. Yes, tasting and harvest dinner is coming up. We also have a new um, experience on site that I wanted to mention for y'all. It is called um, the Vineyard Table Experience. So it's a $75 per person experience. And we've kind of combined our library tasting um, with the food and wine experience. So if you've done either of those before, you know the library experience happens in the library um, where it's secluded, you're surrounded by vines on most sides. And then on one side, um, you have a wall of the wines that were aging on a state. Um, you get to taste those wines. Um, and we've added a culinary experience to lift it. So they are small bites, but substantial enough that you can go back and forth between the wine and the food several times. So it's not like you pop a bite in your mouth and then the food is gone. So we have a substantial amount of um, original culinary treats from uh, Chef Josh Tai. So that is a brand new experience um, that I encourage everyone to go out on site and try. And if you're bringing friends that have never been to William Chris before, Certainly an educational winemaker's experience is fantastic, but this is really a wow experience um, and you will get your uh, members discount on that as well. So I want to see everybody booking an experience to go on site and try that uh, new thing that we've put together for you. Hi, Jennifer, Rachel and Catherine in San Antonio. Hi, Francisco. Everyone say hi from Francisco. Oh, hi, um, Tracy. Is it? Is my video freezing for everybody? Um, just let me know if that's something that I should watch for. Karen and Dan, you're not late at all. Just make sure you get some wine in the glass ASAP. Yeah, if you missed the harvest dinner, don't worry. There'll be um, plenty more experiences and my goal will be to keep you up to date and in touch with everything. Awesome, thanks Michelle um, and Tracy, I don't know what's happening, but um, we record these. So it's just an excuse to have another bottle of wine at another time watching this video. All right. So today is the topic of uh, the art of winemaking. I'm already getting tongue tied because this is a tough, tough conversation for me to have because full disclosure, I have never made wine before. Um, I have never grown grapes before. Um, but what I feel I can offer to this conversation is through my studies, WSET and Court of Master Sommeliers, um, I have been given books and books on vineyard management and winemaking. It's always the first part of the book, and it's always where I get stuck because I find it so interesting. There are so many different things that you can do in the vineyard and in the winemaking process. But ultimately, what I've learned is why that's important to, to know... Um, what defines what's in the glass. So today we won't touch every single part of the winemaking process because first of all, it would take a couple of hours to really go through everything. Um, although I encourage you to ask as many questions as you'd like. But what we're going to look at really is how each part of the winemaking process affects the ultimate flavor. Um, and we're gonna center this around the Grenache Rosé. Um, Tracy, to your question, um, you asked what we're going to continue doing virtually. So I mentioned this is the third to last episode of Summer Sippin'. And then it's fall time. Kids are back in school. We're all busy. We will continue having virtual offerings with uh, Chris and Catherine and uh, myself as well. So I will be keeping you all up to date with what's next. And on our very last episode, I'm going to let you know what the next virtual thing to attend is. Um, so 
Again, all feedback is very welcome. If you enjoyed this, if you'd like to see something like this again, or if you missed the winemakers tastings, tell us about it. We have taken everything that y'all have um, given us and designed more to come. And uh, like I mentioned before, the virtual offerings have become extremely important. Um, it's It's been a really surprising addition to uh, William Chris Vineyards from, from what I've seen because it started during COVID, which is when I started. So I've kind of seen the growth of it and I know that it's only going up from here. Um, so thank you again for watching these series and uh, make sure you go get your summer sip and pack, the very last one, if you haven't already. Only, we're only halfway through the wine, so save them for a special occasion. All right, let's taste this wine. Um, Christopher, I'm so glad you said that. Christopher said, we over tilled our wine and need to let it warm up a bit. I did the exact same thing. And this is something that uh, we're going to talk about as we get into this. So, thanks, Michelle. And hi, Peggy. Thanks for joining. Oh, Moonlight Vineyard. I love your fruit. Oh, hi. Okay, sorry, I'm nerding out. Uh, yes, Christopher, over tilled his wine, we need to let it warm up a bit, but why? Do you like your wine really cold? If you do, drink it cold. But what's the benefit of this warming up in the glass? Um, first, let's look at the color. It is super light, but if you'll notice, it's, um, it's a little bit salmon in color. It's not like a, um, it's not like a pink like this it's almost touching on this color. Can you see those? This is really, really pink. And this is really, really orange. I would say the color of this wine is going more towards the orange. I don't know if that's a really good way to see that. Um, you can also see that around the rim. The orange is the easiest to see around the rim. And even down the center, I have a light shining down here and I can really see that salmon color. This is telling me that oxygen has been in contact with the wine. Um, and we'll go into more about why uh, color changes um, during the winemaking process. And now we smell it. And we already know from the color that maybe we're going to get some secondary tones on this. So maybe um, fruit and flowers, yes, but also some nuts, maybe some honey, maybe some pollen. That comes with that color change. That's the flavor compounds breaking down. Take a smell. It is very subtle in the glass, and I think this is because it's very cold. Now, one way to help this warm up, and Christopher, I encourage you to do this, is to decant this. This is a light colored rose, which means we can expect this to have high acidity, or we expect the acidity to be even more apparent because your flavors are lighter, uh, which means the tartness is going to shine through a little bit more. So let's taste and see if that's true. Absolutely, that's super tart. I would say the tartness is what shines about this wine. How do we bring the tartness into balance? You can't pour from one vessel to another. I have lightly decanted this just to introduce a little more oxygen, but also this vessel is going to absorb some of the cool temperature so that when I pour it back in here, it's not going to be quite as cold. But this glass is cool. So what I've done is I have a second glass that is at room temperature. I haven't warmed it up or anything. But instead of pouring it back in that first glass, I'm going to pour it into another one. So that with each transfer, yes, we're inviting oxygen in, but we're also causing it to warm up in temperature a little bit faster. I'm going to go back to it still a little cold. You can certainly cup it in here, but it's not nearly as cold as it was. And I know that as it sits in this really wide, bold glass, that the glass is going to absorb some of that temperature. And when I actually take a sip, the glass is going to preserve the temperature, but it's all going to even out a little bit more. Does that make sense? And now it's really opening. I can already tell that there's a richness to this wine that wasn't nearly as apparent when it was this bright, cold, tart version. So if you don't like your wine so tart, decant, 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 decant. You could probably decant this in a bigger decanter if you really wanted to. It won't become flabby. The acidity will not change. It will just become less apparent. And that's the goal, is we bring it to the balance that you would like. 
Now, if you like your wines cold, but you don't want the acidity so apparent, just pour it back in that first glass so that the, col the, the temperature is maintained, but the acidity still comes into balance. And then of course, pop it in a wine bucket, which I'm not gonna do because I enjoy this warmer temperature. I want it to warm up a little bit and I wanna see what happens as it does. Oh, Lane's drinking the Wander Series Sinson Carignan blend. Yeah, Lane, that's a great idea. Um, and this is something that we've played around with. Lane says maybe a monthly virtual offering would be really cool. And I agree, we're gonna find as many ways to hit you with virtual offerings as we can. So this is still subtle. I feel like it could warm up more. I know this is going to un unfold in the glass because I trust William Chris Vineyards as winemakers and because I know about the process that this wine went through and I know how delicate and how much time it took to make this wine. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about today. But first, I want to take one more sip and see how the acidity came. I love that temperature. I'm noticing so much more of the fruit around the edges of my tongue, um, which is where I usually notice acidity. And in fact, acidity and flavor compounds can bond together. So when you get that tartness and all you can taste is tartness, know that there are flavors bound in there. You just need to wait for the wine to come into balance or cause it to come into balance. And the cool thing is when you eat a creamy piece of cheese or something honestly fatty, the, uh, the acidity will fall back it's gonna to bond to that, that fat content, that creaminess, and suddenly the flavor compounds will be released and more apparent. And that's, rosé is a universe, universal um, food pairing wine. So that means that you can pair this with really anything, chicken, fish, um, you can even go steak with rosé because it has that bright acidity. All right, let me see if there were any other questions. Let's jump into the art of winemaking. Um, this is gonna be a beast of a topic for me. Um, this is gonna be a lot of information, but uh, we're gonna keep it really general um, because what I want today to be about is showing you pictures of what's happening on site. So I'm sure all of you know that we are in the middle of harvesting grapes um, in the Texas Hill Country and the Texas High Plains, everywhere that we're growing grapes in Texas. Some of the grapes haven't been harvested yet. They're not quite at that acidity sugar balance but our wine growers are out in the field making, um, making sure that the balance is correct, that we're not missing any grapes that are hanging on the vine for too long. And uh, they're doing tests in the lab to see what the sugar level is at, what the pH level is at, and making sure that it's balanced for you. Now, um, oh, where was I? I've already, already lost my place. Um, we all know that uh, we're harvesting the grapes, but the winemaking process starts immediately. So as soon as the grapes are harvested, they go straight to the crush pad and they are made into wine. There's no cooler or freezer that we put the grapes into and they just wait until we're ready to work with them. It happens immediately. So thank gosh we haven't harvested all the grapes yet. We're doing this week by week and we're taking in a certain amount of fruit one week. It's immediately put into fermentation takes and into that winemaking process. The next week it starts over again. Um, so new grapes come in and are made into wine. Um, it is a constant turnover process and if you've ever been on site you know that our production facility is very small it's three tin buildings. One of them is uh, for the bottling and labeling process. So really two buildings is where we do all of our winemaking. Um, and in a video that Chris recently did, he said, and this was um, very, very nice to hear and very astute to me, um, the money has not been put into the production facility to dress it up and make it look super fancy. It is functional. And that is because the money and the effort needs to be put in the grape growing process. And we know this already. This is what William Chris believes that the, um, they're not called winemakers, they're called wine growers because the winemaking starts in the vineyard uh, growing the grapes. But what we're gonna talk about today is just after harvest um, and what happens from there. 
Um, so we're going to be talking a lot about old world low intervention winemaking today. And that is the belief and how William Chris makes all of their wines. And I'll extend that to Lost Straw Cellars as well, who um, we are now under wine, uh, William Chris Wine Company, Lost Straw Cellars and William Chris Vineyards, as well as Skeleton Key and Sway and Growers Project. So all of these wines are made in that similar low intervention old world style of winemaking. And what that means is the winemaking process is as hands off as we can possibly make it um, so that you can taste what the vineyard tasted like and what the grapes um, became that year. Uh, so even though we don't do a ton in the winemaking process, it is still a lot to talk about because there are so many steps and processes. So we just kind of encourage the grapes to go from one step to another and then step back and let that step happen without tinkering, without adding, without um, influencing the wine in a way that would take away from what the grapes originally tasted like. So without further ado, let's look at some pictures of what's happening on site right now. Um, so first, we're gonna talk about black grapes, grapes versus green grapes. So this is a major distinction between styles of wine. If you're making red wine, you're using the grapes on the left. If you are making white wine, you are using the grapes on the right. If you are making rosé, you are absolutely at least using grapes on the left. If you would like, you can use both of these kinds of grapes, but you must have color in the skin in order for it to get here. Because what we don't add is dye. We are not adding a little pink anything to this unless it's in those grape skins. So you have these two major distinctions um, and you have five or six different styles of wine that you can make with this. First is sparkling. You can make rosé, you can make red wine, and you can make white wine. We're going to talk about one other today and that is orange wine. So during these processes, Generally, the process is if you're starting with the grapes on the left, you have red wine, uh, red uh, around the skin, and most often you have white juice inside of that, which means all the color is coming from the skin. Now, in the skin is also your tannin, and this is also where a lot of flavor compounds come from. Most of your fruitiness is coming from the juice inside. So what that means is that if you just crushed those red grapes in your hands, the juice that would bleed out would be white or fairly yellow straw colored. You could make white wine from red grapes. Um, and this is often what happens with sparkling wine. So wines from champagne are often made from red grapes, but they're white or fairly clear in color. Most often what happens with these red grapes is the skin is allowed to sit with the juice for an extended amount of time. Usually there's some warmth in the process that helps pull that red pigment from the, uh, from the skins and it'll stain the juice. If you're making rosé, you allow that staining to happen for a very small amount of time and then you separate the skins. With white wine, it's much more simple. You start with grapes on the right most often, you crush and then you remove the skin. The skins aren't nearly as important to the, the process of white wine making because what you're going for is delicate light flavors most of the time. Now, if you're making orange wine, you are taking grapes on the right. They have a greenish skin, sometimes like Roussan, they can have a pink or a garnet skin. You're crushing the juice out of the white wine skins and you're proceeding as if you're making a red wine. But if you have white skins or pinkish skins, not fully red, you're not gonna get as much color. It's gonna stain the wine kind of an orange color, kind of like this. And then you remove the skins. What you're also extracting from the white wine grapes is tannin, which means orange wine is maybe more similar in profile to red wine. Now, orange wine is not something that we make, but it is a pop topic right now. So I thought I would just mention that because you can use that same staining and um, skin sitting with juice process for both types of grapes. And um, now the last style is making one of each and blending them together. So from there, we'll talk about um, three types of rosés that you can make. 
and I want all of y'all to tell me what you think uh, the Grenache from Vintage Press is. I'm going to check and see if there were questions first. Jennifer asked the same question that I knew was going to be asked is how do you make orange wine? Orange wine is super food friendly as well. It's, it's orange wine is like between rosé and red wine because you get that tannin extraction, but you get about as much color as this, sometimes a little bit deeper. It also helps preserve the wine for a little bit longer. Um, and you know that's what tannin does very well. Kelly, yeah, Kelly uh, said she walked through the vineyard before the grape punch on site. The grapes were smaller than she thought. Keep in mind that each grape variety has different sized grapes. So um, remember we talked about um, Muscat Canelli has really, really small grapes, but a grape like Muscat of Alexandria has golf ball sized grapes. Um, and that is just a variety characteristic. So the other thing to keep in mind is when the berries are small, you're getting a, a higher skin to juice ratio. So you get more of that tannin, more of the flavor from the skin, more color and less juice. And that's just less dilution of those uh, flavor compounds. That's not exactly a bad thing, but I'm really glad you noticed that. Karen, do I think William Chris will make orange wine in the future? Um, I don't think so. That's a very, um, ancient method of making wine. Um, it's, it's happening mostly in very, very old um, winemaking regions and some in California as well. Um, it just depends. I have no idea where William Chris will go. And I don't know that Bill and Chris know either. It's, uh, it's going to be kind of a, a on decision basis. I, um, I think I told Tony, when I first started at William Chris, said it would be really cool if we made a skin contact Roussan, which would be an orange wine. Um, but it just depends. That is all experimentation. I will say that we let um, our white wine sit with the skins occasionally, but not nearly long enough to make an orange wine. Um, and orange wine is kind of a loose term. There's no certain amount of color that you have to extract from the skins, no certain grapes that you have to use before it becomes an orange wine. So you can have an orange wine or just a, a lightly skin contact white wine. So there's a, a huge spectrum in there and you'll certainly see some really deeply colored white wines that say white wine on the label instead of orange wine. And even though it may look and taste like an orange wine, it is up to the producer what they call it. So we may get pretty close to orange wine, even if we never label with orange on the label. I hope that makes sense. Um, Elaine uh, asked, um, is Petit Verdot a small grape as its name implies? Um, actually, Petit Verdot is called that because it means little green one. Um, and it's named that because when you look out into the vineyard and you have Grenache, Syrah, it's not whatever else, and then Petit Verdot, all the other grapes will be black in color and the Petit Verdot will still be green and will still have really small berries. It just ripens after everything else. So in places like Bordeaux, where this grape is grown really regularly, they're harvesting the Cabernet Sauvignon, the Merlot, the Cabernet Franc, and the Malbec, and then the Petit Verdot is still not ready. It has to be harvested really late. Um, and that's actually a big risk to plant and work with Petit Verdot because some, in some places it just never ripens fully and it's not able to. Um, but the size of the berries is actually pretty average, I think. All right, let me take a, a sip of wine before I continue. So we didn't mention sparkling wine and we know that William Chris makes um, two different sparkling wines. One is traditional method, which means that the juice goes through a fermentation and then it is bottled and we start a second fermentation in bottle. And this is the traditional champagne method. So you get very fine bubbles um, and a really, really rich texture. Um, and then we make the pet nat, which is uh, petillant natural, means naturally a little bubbly. What happens here is we start fermentation. Partway through, we pause the fermentation, bottle, and then we continue that same fermentation process in the bottle. So you don't get quite as much bubble. You get a little bit of fizz, but ultimately it takes uh, 
us out of the winemaking process. What happens in the bottle is what happens. We don't get to taste it again. We don't get to control anything. We don't get to blend. It all happens in the bottle. And this is the most ancient way of making wine where there were grapes lying around, people crushed them and put them into a bottle thinking, oh, I'm gonna come back for this later. And when they opened that vessel or bottle, you know, the, the juice made them feel great and it tasted really different. Um, and they hadn't realized that alcohol was the reason for that. Uh, so we make both of those styles and this is all that William Chris experimentation. So let's talk about how rosé is made specifically since we're drinking it. So three ways you can make rosé. First is direct press. This is when you start with red grapes that have, I'm sorry, black grapes that have a reddish, sometimes bluish, sometimes purplish, sometimes actual black pigment in the skin. You crush those grapes. When you crush, some of the pigment leaches onto the juice inside and it stains it pink as it's being crushed. This is an extremely delicate process where you're not getting much flavor from the skin, just a little color to make the wine look absolutely beautiful, but you're getting the freshest flavors of what the juice has to offer. The second way is called saunier, and this is a French term um, that means to stain. No, to bleed is what that means. So what they're doing here is they're taking black grapes, they're crushing it, they're putting the juice and the skins into a fermenter and starting that fermentation process. During the fermentation process, the skins are still staining the juice, eventually a red color. But while that fermentation and staining is happening, you bleed off a little bit of the juice that hasn't become completely red yet. It's a really, really deep color, pink or purple or ruby. You bleed that off and you make rosé and then the rest of the wine you make into a red wine. So this is, it's kind of like stealing wine from the red wine making process to make an extra bonus wine, which is a really, really unique choice because first of all, rosé does not sell for um, as high a price as red wine does, but also because it's just very complicated. You have to bleed that off right at the right time. So you have to watch that fermentation very, very closely. Um, you also have to have tried it before and be using the right grapes that um, can be trusted to make both a rosé and a red wine. Um, and if I didn't mention this before, I don't think I did, rosé grapes are often harvested a little bit earlier than all other grapes. So if you have red grapes in the vineyard, let's talk about vintage press specifically. Bill and Chris probably already knew, and Tony uh, probably already knew that some of the Grenache was going to go into a rosé, and some of the Grenache from that vineyard was going to go into the artist blend. With a rosé, you want to optimize the freshness, and you also want a strong vein of acidity. You often have a little bit less alcohol as well, which means that for red wine making, you want the acidity to fall and the sugar to increase to be balanced. But with rosé, as the acidity falls and the sugar increases, you can actually harvest here. There's a little higher acidity, a little bit less sugar, and you can make a really vibrant, extremely fresh rosé. Um, and this is probably what happened at Vintage Press. We harvested some of the Grenache grapes earlier to go into this wine. So in the Saunier process, you don't have that option. You are using grapes that are at some level here. And they have that level, that balance has to work for both rosé and for the red wine that you're making. So it takes a little bit more forethought. And then the final way of making rosé is blending. You can make white wine and you can make a red wine and then you can just mix them together. So I would really like to hear what you all think this one is based on everything that I just told you. I'm going to wait for some comments before I keep going. We have made um, all of these styles. Um, the, let's see, the Pet Nat Rosé, that uh, Petiant Natural is a blend of red and white grape varieties. And then um, think about the Malbec Rosé, our Merved Carignan Rosé. We have worked with those styles before. Karen has said, direct press, does anyone care to, um, guess Sanye you're blending for this one. I guess blending is out because 
I've already told you guys that, I mean, with the label that Grenache is the grape in this. If you look on the back, you see that it says Grenache Rosé. We are very candid about um, what amount of each grape is in our bottle of wine. So, you know, this is 100% Grenache, which is a red grape. So obviously we haven't blended here. All right, we have three for direct press, one for Saunier. Yes, Sherry, um, I, I did not harvest vintage press. She's asking whether um, these grapes were harvested earlier for increased acidity and minerality. I assume that is so, but I did not harvest these, so I'm not absolutely positive. But I have a strong, strong feeling that yes, that's exactly what happened here. This is direct press. Thank you all for your feedback. Yes, this could have been a Sanye. This could have been a direct press, either one. You get this kind of color with both styles. With Sanye, what could we expect? A little bit more fruit and a really, really round texture and probably a deeper color than this. Um, Sanye method wines are great if you love drinking red wine but you're going for something a little bit brighter, but not so bright as this. Sonia is kind of an in-between, often. And because you're getting a little bit more contact from the skin, you can get a little tannin in your Sonia method uh, rosés. You can also get some of those really complex savory flavors or earthiness. Um, and that's something that's very, very different than this, which is ultimately very fruity. Thanks for your feedback on that. All right, so we've talked about rosé. Now let's talk about the process of winemaking. And I'm just gonna show you pictures of what our winemaking process is like right now. Um, so if you have any questions during this or if you see something in these pictures that you don't recognize, let's talk about it um, because I'm still trying to crack this process as well. Um, this is a difficult topic to talk about because there are several different steps and processes to make um, each style of wine. And really the secret to making wine is doing all of the steps, but in just different orders. So for instance, the pressing of white wine happens before the pressing of red wine would in the process. And this is just, it's based on the grapes that we have to start with. So when we have harvested the grapes, we have either machine harvested them on the left, you see um, a machine that's kind of sitting over the grapes, um, the grape vines. I'm sorry, it's a very dark picture. This is because we start harvest at 4 a.m. We start extremely early uh, because the rest of the day, first of all, has to be used for making the wine. It has to be, it has to start being made immediately. Um, but also when you harvest the, the grapes, when they're a little bit cooler, you tend to have better balance. If uh, the sun rose and started to heat up these grapes, all of a sudden your acidity sugar balance is starting to creep towards your unbalanced area. So you harvest at night um, and then pour into these bins. Um, and these are just nondescript bins that carry our grapes from one place to another. This machine is awesome. It kind of shakes the vines into a little um, kind of shallow bucket at the end so that the process is extremely delicate. It does shake the vines, which are hardy, but the grapes are very delicate. So there must be a really careful process here because as soon as the grape um, bursts, there is yeast on the outside of grapes uh, just naturally that will start fermenting the juice inside immediately as soon as the skin breaks. Um, this is just the, the natural process of how nature works. What we have to do is prevent the grapes from breaking until they reach high estate because we make everything on site. Other winemakers have the choice of maybe at this vineyard they're at, it's in the Texas High Plains. Maybe there's a production facility on site or nearby. They have the choice of going to that nearby winery and having the juice fermented right away. But that's just not the William Chris and Lost Draw way. We like to have everything done on site so that we have a careful eye over um, the winemaking process. And this is not to tinker with it. This is specifically so that the process is not tinkered with. So another way of uh, harvesting grapes is, and I mention this, even though we're not talking about harvesting and vineyard management, because what happens here, machine versus hand harvesting, directly affects how we treat the grapes. So this is hand harvesting. 
a little bit slower. It's a little bit sunnier because um, it takes much longer to do this. I also wanted to show you this because your Grenache grapes in here were hand harvested. This is the process of sitting on a bucket and snipping the grape clusters off one by one, throwing out the grapes, um, looking at them, knowing that they're not good enough to go into this wine. And that sorting and harvesting process happens all at once. So what you end up with in hand harvesting is whole clusters like this. And look how beautiful that is. Um, on the left is probably Trebbiano from Granite Hill Vineyards. We hand harvest the Trebbiano blocks there. And on the right side, that is high state. So those are the Tanat grapes that we're going to drink next week. So our Tanat grapes here were hand harvested. And they're just gorgeous. So here you don't see a lot of um, stems and leaves. These have really been destemmed during the hand harvesting process. That doesn't happen in the machine harvesting process. So the next step is going to the crush pad. And this is um, where the destemming and the hand harvest versus the machine harvest really matters. And I'll tell you why in just a second. So I just love this picture of Chris where his knees are almost touching the steering wheel and he's driving this tiny heister. Um, so he's loading the bins here from the refrigerated truck uh, behind him. You see that big cooler on the back? This is a mega cooler so that we don't have to spray a ton of sulfites on the grapes to carry them from all over Texas back to our site. Um, all we have to do is keep the grapes cool so that if the skin has burst on some of the grapes during the harvest process, that cool temperature will keep the yeast dormant for long enough um, that we can get them to our crush pad to work with them. Oh no, I've gone too far. Don't look yet. All right, we're going to come back to that. I want to see if y'all had any questions about anything I said so far. Karen's done some harvesting. We have a lot of hand harvesting lovers. Um, I can tell you Chris Brundra is really in love with the machine harvester, probably for obvious reasons. If y'all were doing all the hand harvesting, I'm sure that uh, he would, you know, throw away his machine harvester. But we harvest from so many spots across Texas and so many grapes that, uh, that it's tough. Awesome. All right. Sip of wine, everybody. Cheers. So we've gone from the refrigerated truck to the crushed hat. Now, if you've been to our facility before, you know that we have three production buildings. This is the bottling area. This is the rest of the winery over here. And then we have the stainless steel tank room with uh, some oak fermenters as well. And then next to that is sometimes our barrel room, sometimes our oak fermenter room. We have an amphora in there, which is a, a clay pot for fermenting and aging. And we have some cement eggs in there as well. It just depends what we're using it for at that time. And we do a lot of moving in and out of that room, um, depending on what our needs are. So during production, these will definitely look a lot different than um, during the rest of the season. Um, we, we have a very small production facility with a lot of wine that moves through, but we don't want to expand too much on that because our time is spent out in the vineyard like it should be for us. Um, and so why expand on something that's working really well? Our crush pad used to be in between these two buildings here. We have a lab right here as well, which is where we test all the grapes. So our crush pad was there, which means all the bins are stacked high around this area as everything's loaded off of the truck. The bins are stacked high and we get to them one at a time. Um, we had a, a crushing machine, which is a big metal machine that has these rollers inside that helps to de-stem and crush the grapes. And what we'll do is we'll pour some... Um, some wood chips in that are completely neutral in flavor. And those just help kind of squeeze extra tannin and color out of the juice as the crushing process is happening. And this is just to maximize on that crushing process. Ultimately, those chips are removed. They don't impart anything. They don't affect the flavor in any way. And um, they're not sprayed with any chemical or anything weird. It's just, uh, it's like adding extra hands in the process to press and press. Now, 
we have changed our crush pad. So now when you come on site to book that uh, new library experience, you have to go to our production facility. Um, you won't have to go in it because we have a lot of wine in there right now and it's it's uh, a little bit close quarters right now. But if you go towards the production facility, you'll see over here, productions here, there's a large concrete pad that now has this beautiful metal machine that has a big hook. You can bring a truckload of grapes up there, a whole flatbed, put them into this massive crusher that we had specifically designed for us, and it will crush grapes like in a quarter, maybe a sixth of the time that it used to. So this does nothing different to our process except help us maximize on time so that we can, we can spend less time crushing grapes in this tiny crush pad with this tiny machine. And we have a mega machine that will help us be more attentive to the wine in the winemaking process. Crushing is only one part of it, so it should go by very fast. So what Chris said in a, in a video I watched recently was before you would get two to three truckloads, um, a full flatbed of grapes in, and it would take an entire day to crush those grapes and then get them into fermentation machines. Now, one truckload of grapes can be crushed in 30 minutes, and it's entirely because of this new um, area that we've set up on the production facility. I'm sorry I don't have pictures of this, but I want everyone to go on site and see it for themselves um, because we have not used it before now. So this is a really cool new uh, new thing that we have um, added on. So yay to Tony and Chris and Brad, uh, who's the winemaker at uh, Lost Raw Cellars and Andrew for um, implementing this new amazing machine. It was um, designed specifically for our needs. So we're doing direct press rosé, which means the wine goes into the crusher and it goes immediately into a fermentation tank because the skin is not sitting with the juice. So we can run the juice along hoses directly into the fermentation tanks. Now the crusher will take hand harvested red grapes and lead them up this long pipe and crush them so that the skin and the juice is directed into a fermentation machine. And that's a process um, called maceration. You keep the skin and the juice together so that the skins can macerate with the juice and you can get the color and tannin you need from the red wines. Now the third step that this crushing machine can do is it can take uh, machine harvested grapes that still have the stems and leaves on them and it can run them up that line all the way to the top. They will de-stem and de-leaf along the way and then you can catch the, uh, the skins and the juice and direct them into the correct fermentation machine. I hope all of that made sense because I don't have pictures for you, but um, the point is this crush machine has allowed us to treat all the grapes individually um, from vineyard site to vineyard site. Um, we don't want to do everything in a recipe same way from vineyard site to vineyard site because as the flavor changes from vineyard site to vineyard site, so do the grapes and their needs. So this way we're able to take the grapes in um, the best way for that vineyard and this crushing machine will allow us to treat each of those batches differently. Um, and this is the master design of Tony Ophill, Chris Brun, Bill Blackman, Brad Buffalo, and Andrew Sides um, because the process from there is entirely decided by them and their crews. Um, you guys know we make a lot of different kinds of wines and something that we live by is innovation. This is why we're calling winemaking an art because there's not a recipe for it. So as soon as the grapes are coming in, Chris and Tony are tasting the grapes and saying, this would be great if we did this and that. So let's put it into the crushing machine and let's just do it. Um, the other thing that will help decide what, what happens next is what we have available room-wise. Um, are all the fermenters taken? Does that mean we have to do a little bit of a different process with that? Um, you know, sometimes these oak fermenters are used to let the juice and the skin sit with each other, um, which means that another wine can't be fermented in, to, in that vessel until that uh, juice staining process is done. So let's go back and look at some awesome pictures. I'm going to see if you have any questions about that part. Karen's bottle is empty. I wish I could say that I had been drinking this entire time, but I was talking. Mm. 
Lane's going to be harvesting again soon. That's awesome. Thank you for your help. Um, and anyone who wants us, uh, to assist with the harvesting process, let us know. I think we have uh, large crews of volunteers going out into the vineyards, and this will be happening um, through September, uh, early September. Another sip. Mm. Jennifer, good question. What exactly is a crush pad? Um, crushing is the first step of the process. So we're taking grapes that are fully intact, trying not to let them ferment. When it is time to start the fermentation process, the first step is to crush the grapes. So you, you basically have, we have a big cement area that we can power wash, allow grapes to come in, and we go through the process of crushing grapes, which means a crush pad is used for bringing in grapes that are ready to be crushed and then actually crushing them. So if you, if you went into the crush pad during uh, the crushing process, everything's stained red. There's, you know, water and wine all over the floor. There's lots of um, grape skins everywhere. There's leaves and such everywhere. Um, because we're, we're using that area to um, prep the grapes so that they were putting clean juice into the fermentation tanks. I, I hope that made sense. But at the end of that, we can remove everything, power wash it off, and it's a beautiful concrete slab again. So that's a, that's a crush pad. Um, and I'm sure there are many different looks to a crush pad, but ours is a, a big cement area. It, it looks like a mini gymnasium a little bit. Um, and it's completely out in the uh, outdoors. We um, we do this mechanically. So we have a big metal crusher that has this big like corkscrew looking thing. It, it actually does look exactly like this. So this will be hooked up to a, a metal machine. You'll push the grapes in here and this will start to churn and it will very delicately just break the skins. And we're not like stabbing the skins. We're not really trying to smash the grapes. We're just trying to open them up so that the ju juice can come out and start its fermentation process. All right, so what happens after crushing? This is the maceration process, and this is where it starts, you can go down one road or you can go down another. So for instance, you can go down the road of cold soaking, and I want y'all to look closely on the left-hand side. You'll see a tag on that oak fermenter. That's Claire in the center. She's our assistant winemaker. Um, on that tag, you see it says uh, Blackman Malbec. So this is uh, from Blackman Ranch Vineyards. And this is the Malbec that was harvested from there. Um, you see the date on there was August 4th. So that's when the grapes came in. And from the 4th to the 6th, those grapes are scheduled to be cold soaked. So what we know is happening inside of that is the crushing process has happened. A hose like the one that Claire is holding has led the crushed juice and the skins into that big oak fermenter that you see. And the skins are sitting with the juice at a cool temperature. Now, why at a cool temperature? We do this at a cool temperature because as soon as you warm everything up, the color starts being extracted very, very heavily, which is a wonderful thing. Color in wine is fantastic, but what's extracted at the same time as color is tannin. And if you extract too much tannin, you can throw off balance. But there are also flavor compounds in the skins. And so if you're going for a fruity or more delicate style of wine, warming up that process of maceration can throw off the balance of your wine. So what this tells me of, is what our winemakers have decided to do is to create a delicate, fruity, lightly colored red wine for you. Um, and then after this, what's going to happen is Claire will use a hose to drain that juice off of the skin. She's going to put it through the machine that she's putting wine through right here, and it's going to remove the skin from the process. So you're just going to get the juice and the skin will be left away. I hope that makes sense. Um, I have a couple more pictures of Claire doing some work here for you. And I'm going to disappear for a second. So during the maceration process, you can cold soak, which happens before fermentation. So right now this wine isn't fermenting. It's just cold soaking. Um, the reason it's not fermenting yet is because during the fermentation process, heat is released. So you can't 
cold soak at the same time that it's fermenting because heat is being released. Extended maceration is something that William Chris Vineyards works a lot with. And we've actually done experimentation on this. And I think Chris and Bill have put together scientific papers on what their experimental extended maceration process is like. So while this Blackman uh, Malbec is going through a two day cold soak, and that's all the, the color is getting to the wine, extended maceration can sometimes go on for two months. The longest extended maceration that I know that we've done is 150 days. And we've done this with, most recently with the Leahy uh, Merved that was blended into the Texas High Plains Merved. What this extended maceration does is certainly extract a ton of color and uh, a ton of flavor as well. But it also allows for the tannins to soften over time. Um, what they do is, you know, you have tannin compounds here and here over time they slowly form together and create larger molecules. Um, so the tannin is a little bit um, less uh, aggressive. So we have the softening of tannin and the adding of extra pigment and flavor compounds. So it doesn't create a better product. It just creates a different product. Um, and that's something that added depth, I think, to our Texas High Plains Merved. Um, and I think that's a really, really lovely um, practice. So ask Chris next time you come in about our extended aging of specifically Merved. It has, it has led to some really, really innovative wines and some superior ideas about um, how long extended maceration can actually go on. And if you look online at extended maceration, you're going to see that 60 days is the most that's recommended. We have blown that out of the water for our own benefit. All right, so let's go back to these pictures. Uh, carbonic maceration, um, this is a big twist and we're not gonna talk a lot about this today. This is when you just need to, we'll talk another time about carbonic maceration. This is when you take those beautiful clusters of berries and you skip the crushing process and you just put all the whole clusters of berries that are unbroken into a closed vessel. You seal it and you add pressure so that the grapes start to burst from the pressure and they start their fermentation process. It leads to completely different flavor profiles, and we do do carbonic maceration for some of our wines. Um, if you've ever done, if you've ever tasted the uh, carbonic um, tanat, it's led to a very different style of tanat that than we're going to taste next week. Um, and if you want some of that, uh, reach out to me at uh, KelseyKR at WilliamChrisWines.com, and I will see if I can find some for you. Um, and you'll really get carbonic maceration as soon as you taste that wine. All right, so I mentioned during the fermentation process that heat is released. Um, what is also released is carbon dioxide. And what you see here is a picture of um, the grape skins sitting on top of the juice that's underneath. What they've created is a cap. So where the juice and the skins are usually mixed up together, as soon as fermentation starts, the carbon dioxide kind of causes the skins and everything to float to the top and it kind of seals in the juice, which is a great thing because the flavor compounds can really interact here. You take oxygen largely out of the process, um, and then you see this little bubbling on top. So if you, if you ever go into a winemaking area, you're going to notice the fermentation by the smell, but also if you see bubbles anywhere, you know that it is currently fermenting, and that is that yeast is eating the sugar in the juice and is releasing heat turning the sugar into alcohol and releasing carbon dioxide as well. So the other picture you see here is um, some lovely volunteers pressing down the cap because as soon as everything floats to the top, the juice is no longer in contact with everything that's on the cap, except in a very small amount. So what we do is we have people push it down for us. Um, often that's done by ourselves, but because we want you guys to be involved in the winemaking process and really understand how it happens, we invite people to come in and scrub down three or four times and push down that cap for us. And that leads to a very gentle extra extraction of um, the tannins and the pigmentation. And during that, you get to hear Chris Brundrett and Tony Ophill talk to you about their winemaking process. And I'm sure it's just a mind blowing experience. So if you've done that before, tell me about it. Um, we just went through, I think the three periods of, uh, of punch downs that um, some of y'all got to volunteer at. So 
I didn't mention, and I want to, the yeast that we use because natural yeast is a big thing right now. Um, so yeast is present naturally on grape skins. But what we do is we add a specific strain of yeast. We have a mother that, that keeps this yeast coming and we've decided to use that specific yeast because we can have consistency from bottle to bottle. But also the specific yeast that we use does not interfere with the natural flavor of the grapes and of the place that they come from. So, and I've talked to Tony O'Phil about this, the yeast that we use is specifically chosen so that we can still have the sense of place and the sense of that grape, even after the fermentation process. And what you sometimes get with natural yeast fermentation, which is when you just take the yeast that were present on the outside of the grape and ferment with that, um, you can get off flavors, you get unpredictability. But ultimately the flavor is coming from what the type of yeast was on the grape. Um, but we've chosen something that, that gives you a raw expression of our grapes. So from place to place, you can actually taste the minerality, the terroir. You can taste the shift from um, grape to grape and place to place. And we do this because we work with 44 vineyard owned prop, I mean, uh, 44 different family owned vineyard properties. We harvest a lot of grapes ourselves. There are so many places we source grapes from and we work with uh, over 25 different grape varieties. We want you to be able to see the shift from grape and place and not see the shift from the yeast, if that makes sense. So that's a particular choice that relates to William Chris Vineyards. Um, and I couldn't speak to how Lost Ross Cellars does it, but I think that would be a really interesting question for um, Brad and Andrew of Lost Ross Cellars, and even Chris Brundrett and Tony would probably know about it as well. Um, I assume the process is similar because we're both working in a similar style, but ultimately we make wines in different ways um, because we came from different places and then joined together recently. So um, I'd like for all of y'all to ask how Lost Ross Cellars does it differently. What, uh, what do they stand for and what, what makes them different? Jennifer, I don't know that question. Jennifer has asked, um, have we always added yeast and the same yeast? Um, I would assume that we've never done, um, you know, I don't know. Uh, this is this is how I know we do it now. And certainly Tony Ophill has been here for um, three or four, maybe five years making wine with us. But before that, I don't know. I do know that Tony has been game changing and he's shifted the way we treat our white wines and who knows what else. So. These are questions to come on site and ask. And um, we're talking about this because we want you to know about our winemaking process, um, what it takes to be hands off in the right way. Um, we want y'all to be a part of it and learn more about it. It gets really, really nerdy, but understanding this process is, um, it makes it even more of an honor to drink these wines. So yeah, come in and ask. Um, I, I'm not the expert on this, but I can speak to a little bit more now than I used to be able to. And that's all thanks to the William Chris Vineyards team. <laughs> Rachel got to uh, punch down on some of the, oh, on your honeymoon, that's awesome. It seems like a lot of y'all got to go through that process and that's amazing. All right. So I want to make sure I get through the rest of the winemaking process before we hop off. There's not much left to go, even though it is a big topic and we could talk about this forever. So what you're looking at here is our large oak fermenters. This holds about 22 times the amount that a small barrel could. So we're mostly fermenting in these, but we are also aging our wines in some of these. And the big difference there is how much oxygen is actually getting to the volume of wine. So if you're using a smaller barrel, you have a higher contact of the wine with oxygen because the wood is porous. In these, you have less oxygen contact. Um, what Chris loves about these is the texture that's added to the wine. And if you'll go back to the Grenache um, from Vintage Press, you will notice that it has a lovely creamy texture, especially as it warms up. And that is because this was fermented in a large oak fermenter. and then was aged in stainless steel for four months. So you have a little bit of oxygen in, in the uh, process. And 
another way that you can kind of guess that oxygen was processed, uh, part of the winemaking process is because this has a cork and the cork is allowing oxygen in. So this wine is not afraid of oxygen. It will transform and be more beautiful with that contact. And that's also the reason the color has changed in this wine is because it has gone through these oak fermenters. So what you're seeing here is after Claire used that hose to get all of the juice out of the wine, what's left over is a massive amount of what's called must, M-U-S-T. And this is all the skin, anything that was left over and is large and chunky. And on the right, I know it's really difficult to see, but you have a, a bucket sitting inside of this oak fermenter that is has largely been cleaned out by Tony, but is still covered in the skin that was part of that red wine making process. So the reason I'm showing you this is because our guys have to, and girls have to clean the insides of these stat. As soon as that process is done, you clean it out, you spray it down, you make sure all the wine and the seeds and the skin are gone so that you can put more wine immediately into it. And I want to I want to stress how fast this process is um, because we only have maybe less than 15 of these large oak fermenters, maybe st 10 stainless steel fermenters, and then three or four, maybe six concrete eggs. That's it. And we're making so much wine that the process really needs to turn over very fast because the wine cannot just be sitting without being fermented. Once it's ready to ferment, it's going to ferment whether you like it or not. And Christopher, that's a great question. Do you try and kill off the natural yeast before adding the new yeast? Um, no, no. Um, and I know that because killing the natural yeast would add something to the process that's chemical like, and that's not part of our process. We don't, we don't, um, add chemicals to, you know, beautiful, fresh grapes in order to kill something on them. Um, I don't know what that's like. Um, maybe natural yeast is part of the process in a small amount, but our yeast um, is more active and ready. That's a really good question that I don't know the answer to. I'm sorry, Christopher. I, I would love to answer that. Um, something I didn't think about. I'm glad, Karen, that you got to meet Tony. He's awesome. Talk to him about the Mary Ruth sometime in the process that he goes through. One thing I didn't mention about this wine um, is during the pressing process, so you the grapes, the Grenache grapes have gone into the crusher. They are directly pressed off of the skins over the course of one and a half hours. So the, the pressing process um, when you're extracting the juice and taking the skins out of the process, that can happen over one and a half hours. It can also happen over four hours and something Tony has implemented for white wines and rosés is a slower pressing process. So the skin has more contact with the juice, but you're able to slow down that process and extract the most delicate flavors from the wine. Um, so a four hour pressing is a long time. It means that we have to have the time to invest in that. And if other grapes are coming in, it makes that a little bit difficult but it's worth it because of the amount of delicacy in this wine. Those, those really, really subtle flavors is what Tony has made sure to extract from this rosé, the Mary Ruth, and a large amount of our other wines. Um, the other thing that's important about this wine is the fermentation lasted 35 days. Fermentation can last for a week or less sometimes, but fermenting at a slower rate, um, first of all, takes more time but um, can allow for the delicacy to remain in the wine. And we've, I mentioned before that fermentation is a really rigorous process um, and that you can't really, you can't, it's hard to damage a wine after it's been through fermentation because it's been through a tough process already. But during that fermentation process, if you're not careful, if you're not subtle with the wine, you can lose something. So a really slow fermentation process has preserved as much delicacy and flavor in this wine as possible, um, which is part of the reason I, I recommend warming it up a little bit because there is a ton to this wine. It, it took so long to make this wine and it took a lot of careful thoughts um, to make it what it is. Christopher, what happens to the must? So the must is the skin and seeds, everything that's left over afterwards. The must is pressed so that the remaining juice can be released from the wine. 
And after that, um, I think it's added to the garden. But I don't know. That's another great question. Christopher, if you keep asking questions, I'm not going to be able to answer anything. Um, that is a really great question. I know that some people make the must of their, um, their grapes into a jam or such. And we, we certainly may use this in, in making some of our culinary masterpieces with Chef Josh Tai, but I think um, a lot of it's used in the garden. Uh, though I'm not sure that's a great question. We have a lot of grape must. Um, it's a large volume of, uh, of the grape that we lose during that, that pressing process. So next on the right hand side, you'll see that that tag says post press. So what you know is happening here is um, the wine is going through fermentation. So the cold soak has happened. The juice has been drained off of the skins. The skins have been pressed and the wine went into a second oak fermenter in order to ferment. Now, during this, two different fermentations will happen. There's primary fermentation where the sugar is turned into alcohol and the secondary fermentation converts the acid from malic acid to lactic acid. And this sounds complicated, but really it's taking malic acid, which is your tart green apple type of acid and turning it into lactic acid, which is more like acid in milk. It's just softer and creamier. So this is something that 90% of red wines go through and maybe 30% of white wines go through in the world. If you want the wine to be bright and fresh and tart and apparently tart, then you're not going to do that second fermentation. But if you want a rounder, richer, creamier mouthfeel, you're going to do the malolactic fermentation. So this is going through two fermentation processes in this picture. So the primary fermentation is converting into alcohol and the second one we allow to happen naturally. So we don't come in and say malolactic fermentation, you need to happen now. We allow them to bleed one into the other because we believe that this um, allows for the wine to be a little bit more harmonious and balanced. Now we didn't talk about the different fermentation vessels. Stainless steel, no oxygen. Large oak fermenter means a little bit of oxygen in contact with the, uh, the volume of the wine. Concrete egg. This is something that's used in Spain. It's used in Italy. It's used in France. Um, sometimes you have just big concrete tanks, but the egg specifically allows for the wine to move as it's being fermented. This can allow for a uh, more even maceration. You don't have to quite you don't have to punch down during this because the, the cap is moving a little bit. You can kind of get to the top of the egg and stir it around. And then the Galileo is uh, the center picture. It's a round ball with a crank that kind of turns it. So you can um, keep the wine moving and turning it. We're the only Texas producer to own one of these. And we are one of the three owners in the world of the Galileo. This is something that we don't talk about a lot because this is a big part of our experimentation. We're just starting our experimentation with this, but incredibly proud to have um, an amazing tool like this to try something different with wine. Um, and what we've noticed about the concrete eggs and concrete in general for, for um, aging and fermentation is that you get a reward of texture. You get beautiful texture with these wines. And if you've ever had the Malbec Rosé uh, from High Estate, it was concrete age and it's a rosé that's thick and creamy and mineral and it's not super fruity. It has all this nutty, wonderful stuff in it. It's completely unique. Um, and that's something that we've added to our winemaking regimen because it's unique. It's cool. It allows for you to taste the terroir of Texas, but in with a unique texture. And then finally, you can use uh, clay, clay pots. To ferment wine and we do have a clay pot that we have made a clay pot to not with. This is where we um, are pressing red wine. So the pressing of white wine and rosé happens earlier in the process but when red wine is ready to be pressed the juice is completely fermented. We're putting it through this machine so that the, the juice can run off and be filtered so that it's more stable in the bottle and uh, the dead yeast cells can be removed in a large amount um, and then the skins will be pressed so that we get all the juice that we can from them. Now during this process the filtering is pretty light. Um, 
you want to remove some of it from the wine um, because the wine will be a little bit more stable, but we do not remove everything. We don't do a heavy filtration of our wines. Um, what you really want to do, especially if you have a white wine, is you want to filter out um, anything that will allow the wine to ferment once again in bottle um, because there is lots of yeast, lots of different bacteria that come with your grape skins and they are very active. They want to be very active, so they will continue to change the wine. Um, but if you've noticed in our white wines, our rosés and our red wines, they are often a little bit hazy because filtering and fining too hard can remove what I call the soul of the wine. It can, um, it can break the wine, I think. You get something stark and stale and maybe pretty, maybe tasty, but it's not lively and it's not, it doesn't taste like a living wine. And that's ultimately what we want to give you. Now, the fining process is a little bit different than filtering. When you want to get micro particles out of the wine, you add something to the wine like charcoal that will allow small particles to bond to it, and then you remove that from the wine. So we do a little bit of that as well, just to keep the wine stable so that it doesn't become sour wine in the bottle for you. And then we're getting to the final process, which is um, putting into the aging vessel. Now we can age in any of the fermentation vessels, the concrete egg, we can um, age in oak fermenters, we can mature the wine in stainless steel tanks like we did with the Grenache uh, Rosé here. And we can do small oak barrels and the oak barrels must be toasted so that they curve into barrel shape. So when the barrel's being made, um, you light a fire within, it warms up the barrel so that you can wrap it in these metal rings. Um, but that leads to a little bit of toasting inside the barrel. When the barrel is used first, it will impart that flavor to the wine. There's smokiness, there's toast, there's vanilla, there's cinnamon, whatever else comes with that. But after using these barrels for long enough, that flavor is no longer imparted. So you're getting just the raw flavor of the wine. And I think all of you know, we do a combination of new and used oak that no longer imparts flavor. We want a little bit of seasoning to complement the wines, but we don't want to cover anything. What you see Tony doing here is topping off the barrels. So this is an important process because as the wine is maturing in this barrel, some of the water is evaporating off, which means that the barrel once full, the amount of wine will go down and there's oxygen in contact with this wine. So he has a careful eye on every single barrel that we work with in all three of our locations where our wine is maturing. And he's constantly topping off the barrels to keep the oxygen level um, tight. And finally, this is the end of our winemaking talk, but I did want to show you we talked about um, a matterized wine, um, and this is the um, Jacques. So the Jacques is, is made of white wine grapes. The white wine grapes are crushed. They go through the fermentation process. We add brandy to it um, to add a little extra alcohol. And we stop the fermentation early to leave some sugar in the wine to balance that alcohol. Then we bake the wine for two years in the Texas sun. And I, I show you this because one, it's really, really cool. Um, it's the ultimate sense of place, um, but also because we're constantly pushing the limit and trying new things. There is no limit to what we do and there's no recipe. And I just want to stress that we do some seriously cool things on site and there's no way to know about everything that we're doing unless you're Chris or Bill. Um, maybe Tony doesn't even know. Catherine, great question. Where is that? Um, this is in our Madeira house on site. So I mentioned the production facility is here. The rest of the vineyard is over here. You have the farmhouse here, you have the high society building over here. The material house is right near the production facility. If you step off the crush pad, um, going away from our new big crushing machine, there's a teeny tiny squat little house that has no air conditioning. It's made of cement and uh, it has a little tin roof on top and we just have barrels baking in the sun over there. We have a little refrigerator uh, back there, but otherwise it's super tiny. Um, and we have like 10 barrels in there that are baking some more dessert wine for you. Um, one of our cooler projects that I really nerd out about because I really like dessert wines. Um, but that's, that's two extra years after the fermentation process. Um, the wine that went into those barrels is at, it, at least a year old and may not be released for another year. So, um, 
it's just a beautiful process. And knowing how much thought went into this wine just makes me appreciate it a little bit more. Um, the more I learn about what Bill and Chris do, the more amazing I think it is. All right, guys, we're, we're over the end of our time. So I just want to leave y'all off with a thank you for um, sticking with me through the, the winemaking talk. Um, if you have any more questions, you can always toss them my way. I know this is a lot of information, but um, I just wanted to leave you with the idea that winemaking is truly an art and decisions are made at every point along the way. There is no major recipe and there's no mastermind. We're all just trying to take what we did the year before and learn from it. I mean, it, it takes very humble people to do that. Um, so much love to Bill and Chris, Tony, Claire, Remy, the entire winemaking team of William Chris, and then of course to Lostraw, um, Andrew Sides and Brad Buckaloo. Thank you for the amazing wines that you make. Um, they are truly, truly a pleasure to learn about. So with, with that, here's a cheers to all of you guys who have been joining me. Come with your Tanat High Estate next week, uh, decanted for about an hour. If you can open that, take a taste of it, register how intense it is, and then um, decant it for an hour before we hop on together, uh, I think you'll really, really enjoy that um, breathing of the wine. You could go over an hour if you want. All right, guys. I'm going to read all of y'all's comments to see if I missed anything a little bit later. And we will be back next week with more. Um, I don't know what we're going to talk about yet, but I'm going to find out. So let me know if you have any recommendations, by the way. And I'll talk to y'all next week. Bye, guys.